Okay, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us on what appears to be an absolutely beautiful day uh, here up in Scotland. I trust it is elsewhere. Um, thank you for joining us for the uh, fourth and final um, code demonstration that we're hosting here at the uh, UK Data Service. Um, I'm joined you know, once again by my colleague Julia Kazmaier, uh, who will be uh, looking after the chat, posting links, uh, you know, taking questions and just uh, keeping me on track. So thank you for giving up uh, your time today. Uh, it's the fourth and final session. We're going to focus on uh, computational um, environments. So by that, we mean setting up your computer so that you can conduct and reproduce um, a piece of data analysis. Um, a piece of data analysis that you know is computationally dependent or computationally um, intensive. Again, if you're having uh, issues with the sound, the um, video, then please post some uh, comments in the chat if you're logged in to uh, Twitch. Um, and Julie will be able to uh, respond. Uh, so I'm going to do about 40 minutes. Um, computational environments are a wee bit more of a technical topic. Um, you'll see that we've produced uh, a notebook uh, for you to use as well. There's not actually any code in this notebook. Everything we'll be doing um, will be done through the command prompt. Uh, you may recognize this as the kind of little black box of doom that you may have occasionally launched on your machine uh, without realizing it. Um, I'll go through all of that. Um, so what we're basically doing uh, is, uh, and if you need to uh, use this notebook, um, Julia will post uh, the link into the chat, uh, the link into the chat. And yeah, and then you'll be able to follow along. But particularly for today, you won't be executing any code, you know, in the notebook. So you can actually just track what I'm doing. Um, and the notebook is for later on when you want to practice again, set things up on your own machine. Um, but for today, probably, you know, best to keep keep an eye on what I'm uh, doing. So on that note, um, you know, let's get started. Uh, again, you know, about 40 minutes today. Um, but you know, you've got the notebook for um, practicing yourself. I'm looking very large. Let's make myself a tiny bit smaller. There we go. Yes, so key things today, understand what a computational environment uh, is. Um, so be able then to install and to import um, Python modules on your machine. So these are extra functionality um, you know, that we need for scraping web pages, um, manipulating data sets, natural language processing. All these things are not standard uh, with your Python uh, download. Then we'll, we'll learn how to you know, capture the computational environment in which you conducted your work um, and being able to share that with others so they can reproduce and adapt and extend uh, what you've done. Uh, and then we'll actually go through the, the very short process of reproducing a computational environment you know, that somebody else developed um, and then we can actually look at somebody else's uh, bit of work um, on our machine. So very technical um, if you don't have any kind of base knowledge, uh, but actually it's it's a reasonably uh, simple, short task to be able to create environments, capture them, share them, reproduce, um, and I'm going to go through everything from uh, step one. Uh, again, uh, these are Jupyter notebooks that we're using. We're not really going to use this one today. Uh, it's just, it has again the advantage of um, mixing live code, you know, text and outputs. Uh, you're all probably sick of this um, if you've been watching me before. And in fact, it's so out of date that it tells me to enjoy web scraping. And that was uh, two or three um, code demonstrations uh, ago. So what is a computational environment? Just so we're all uh, clear on what we're doing. Um, so each computer has its own unique computational environment. That consists of not just the operating system, not just what software you have installed, maybe you use Python, maybe you use R, maybe you use NVivo, maybe you use Stata, for example. Then you have different versions of that software installed. Maybe you have Stata 14 or Stata 15, um, older versions of SPSS, you know, older versions of Qualtrics, uh, etc. Um, and there's also other features. So, you know, the kind of machine you're doing your work on, you know, is it, quote unquote, a supercomputer that you're using? You know, to conduct your analysis, is it a very cheap, bog standard university machine? And um, all these things. So basically, the machine in front of you, the hardware, and all the software you use to conduct a piece of analysis, 
they constitute the computational environment. Best question we have here is why do you even need to understand that? I'm pretty sure all of you have been doing your work up to this point using a computer and um, you know doing fine robust you know defensible uh, research um, so why do you need to know uh, about this? Basically there's two competing uh, trends and two competing issues. Uh, one is the fact that our work is becoming a bit more computationally um, dependent. So you're not just using a machine because you have to type um, or you need to you know, save and share electronic files. You're increasingly needing you know, highly powerful specialized statistical software, for example, or you need the R programming language, you need the Python programming language, um, or you need big data. The data set's so large, it doesn't even fit uh, on your machine. So we're all becoming a bit more uh, dependent um, on computational environments you know, to produce our work. In conjunction, um, there's a big push in science in particular to improve the transparency and the reproducibility of scientific work. Uh, it's very, very difficult you know, to view a table, to view a graph, um, you know, to, to be told about a pattern that's been found you know, in some empirical data and to be able to take that and go through all the steps, you know, to reverse engineer all the steps the analyst took to produce, you know, the work. It, it's near impossible to take a journal article and to actually conduct the exact same uh, work. So if these two competing, um, you know, trends were computationally dependent to do our work and our work is increasingly opaque, it's increasingly untransparent, very difficult to reproduce uh, what we're doing. So what's critical then is being able to understand and replicate the computational environment in which work is undertaken. And I really like this quote from the Turing Way community um, that any analysis you do really uh, should be mobile. So that means that on your local machine, you know, you can define and create and maintain your workflow. So that's, you know, let's say using Stata, importing some data, estimating a statistical model and spitting out two graphs, for example. Yes, you need to be able to do that yourself for your own purposes. You should be able to move that to another machine in the future. That should be, you know, able to be shared amongst all your teammates and they should all be able to produce the exact same result using the exact same methods. So this is the key idea to get into your head. It's not good enough anymore to just configure your machine uh, and you know you can do your work but you know someone else just has to figure it out themselves um, you know I'm, I'm quite stringent on that I think we need to be better um, as a scientific and an analytical community so that's me giving out to you so how do you capture a computational environment so we know that it's a combination of hardware and software um, so basically it involves recording the computational features um, of your work or to your work so what type of machine did you use? Um, you know, is it a Dell laptop? Is it a Lenovo? Is it a Mac? You know, etc. That's not just geeky knowledge. You know, how much memory does it have? So my machine is eight gigs of memory. Uh, that's you know the amount of information my computer can process at any one uh, time. If I have a 16 gig data set, can I actually load that in and work with it? Um, no, simple as that. Not without you know just sampling from it you know, I'd need a machine with more uh, memory. Which operating system do I have? Is it Windows, Mac, or Linux? You know, that affects, as I'm sure you all know, how files are stored, which types of software you can actually use, you know, with a given operating system, um, etc. You know, which programming language or statistical software did you use? Was it Python or R, Stata, NVivo, Qualtrics, you know, etc. Um, and then which version of that language? You know, Python has, you know, four reasonably recent versions. Um, they're all broadly similar, but are slightly different, unfortunately, and that does impact uh, your analysis. Uh, and then what additional um, you know, packages or modules did you install in order to use Python? So if you want to do natural language processing, uh, you need to install the NLTK uh, module uh, in Python. So that's something extra you have to do to configure uh, your computational uh, environment. And we shouldn't overlook the fact as well that there's lots of miscellaneous um, research objects uh, that are needed to produce you know, a result. You, know, you need the data sets, pretty obvious. Do you need metadata? Do you need documentation, um, you know, et cetera? Uh, there's lots, lots you need. Phew. So a very basic way um, of capturing your computational environment uh, is just simply documenting 
uh, all of the above elements. And, you know, we do that to some degree with a journal article or a paper or a report. You know, we do say, here's the methodology. And you might say, you know, I use this machine, you know, etc. Thankfully, as we'll cover today, there are technological solutions that make this process, you know, much simpler, much quicker uh, and much more uh, robust. So finally, the two key ways of capturing uh, your computational uh, environment. So you can use something uh, called a package management uh, system. In Python, there's kind of two main ones, uh, conda and pip. Um, don't have to worry about what they are now. We'll use pip uh, throughout this demonstration. Uh, basically, they keep track of all the uh, modules you use in your research. Uh, so for example, when we did web scraping, we made uh, great use of the requests module. Um, that needs to be installed separately. That then needs to be kept up to date because there'll be newer versions uh, and PIP or Conda help you manage that um, process. You can also, either in conjunction or separately, use uh, either a virtual machine or something called um, a container. A virtual machine is basically uh, the computer in front of you um, run as an app. So you can package up your computer. If you can imagine that making sense, you can put that online uh, and then you can use that computer whenever you need it. So it's similar to, you know, using software as a service, you know, instead of installing something to your machine, you're using a, a service in the cloud. Um, and a container then is a much smaller version of that. It's basically like uh, a zip file containing all of the software, all of the code, all of the data files um, that you can move between computers and it'll work on each one. So it's not a computer itself, it's just a, a zip file basically, or a container, like a shipping container with everything you need to do uh, to reproduce um, a piece of uh, analysis. Great, so how do we actually uh, do all of this you know, fantastically technical, interesting stuff? So again, uh, if you stuck with me, um, I research charities, very, very interesting, uh, very topical, unfortunately. Uh, so we're going to set ourselves a computational task. So we're going to download um, from my home country uh, a list of all the registered charities in the Republic uh, of Ireland. And we're going to do this um, using uh, Python. So the first thing we need to do is we need to create our computational um, environment. So the first thing, and I've done it already, is you do have to have a copy uh, of uh, Python. So I'm not going to go through this now. It's an actually really easy uh, process. So if you go to the python.org website, I'm sure some of you have done this uh, you know, already. Um, here's the latest version for Windows. Uh, if you have a different operating system, uh, you'll be able to do that um, as well. So you would just follow the, you know, the really simple instructions here. You'll have downloaded uh, a version of Python uh, to your machine. Uh, so what what then is the difference between what I'm saying? So if we've already downloaded Python, is that all you need uh, to do? So the approach we're going to take is that every single piece of work um, should have its own version of Python. Now that doesn't mean installing it multiple times as we're about to see, but what it does is it involves making isolated copies of your download of Python and putting those in different folders you know, in your machine. So for me personally, I like to have a um, projects folder uh, on my machine. Uh, and into all of that, I have all the various things uh, that I am uh, working on at any given time. So here you go here, I've got a, a projects folder. Everything with the code demos is here. Um, anything to do with charity data for the Republic of Ireland is here. Uh, got some research I'm doing, et cetera, um, et cetera. And what I do is for each of these separate projects, they all have their own copy of Python, which is perfectly tailored for the work involved. So if I don't need web scraping for one of these projects, it will not be installed in that folder. It will be installed for other projects, but it won't be in that particular folder. And the reason why that's important is because different Python packages or R packages or whatever way you, you, you want to do this, all depend on different versions of other packages. So the natural language processing package will need a certain version of um, another package, for example. But if you're doing something else, if you're web scraping, that will require a different version of the same package. Uh, and then suddenly you get in an entanglement. So if you only have one copy of Python, what ends up happening is you have to keep updating and downgrading the versions of the same um, 
of the same package just to meet you know the specific requirement you know at that time much better set up a computational environment for every separate project they're all self-contained and they can't um it's a poor choice of language but they can cross contaminate each other computational environments are basically like quarantine unfortunately which is very relevant uh, to what we're doing right now so the preliminary as i said uh, we just want to check if python um ah, ah that's why it kicked out i should be in this one apologies uh, no I was using the online version uh, of the code, um, but I'll use the one on my machine uh, just because, uh, yeah, perfect. So using Python, I can say, right, which version do I have? Okay, so version 3.7, as you can see, there's a version 3.8, and um, I haven't upgraded uh, just yet. Um, and then I can figure out where my copy of Python um, actually is. So on my hard drive, which is the C drive, there's a folder called Anaconda 3, and in that is Python, basically. So as I said previously, what we're gonna do is make multiple copies of that version of Python and spread them out um, across project uh, folders. So the first thing to do is we wanna create a project folder. So we're gonna download some charity data. Um, so let's create a, a folder. Usually you might do it, you know, this way. You might open up, you know, Windows Explorer or whatever it is on a Mac. Apologies, um, you know, and you would go uh, to the C drive, and you know, you would, yeah, you know, right-click, new folder, um, etc. We can do all of that through the command prompt. So on a Windows machine, if I type cmd, you'll see the command prompt. This is variously known as the command line interface. PowerShell, uh, the terminal, I think on a Mac, um, the bash shell, shell scripting, lots of different, lots of different uh, terminologies. Basically, this is a very um, rudimentary way of interacting with your machine. Instead of writing programming code, you can kind of write much simpler code that tells the machine uh, to do something. So just to prove that, you know, uh, all of this is happening um, in real time, um, you can see the command prompt is telling me that we're currently in a folder uh, on the C drive called users. Uh, and here's my uh, university uh, username. Uh, so users, here we go. Yeah, perfect. So I have a list of folders of things I do. Um, and as you can see, there's nothing called charity data download uh, just uh, yet. So I take this line of code here. So copy and paste that into my command prompt, like so. I use the right click there, or you can use Control V if this is a Windows machine. And it executes the command, and if we want to you know, take a look again, uh, voila, there we go, the folder's been uh, created. That's a very, very simple command. MKDIR just means make directory, so create the folder. So the second thing then is I wanna move into that folder. Uh, so I can do that through the command prompt as well. CD just means change directory. So go inside that new folder. And now you can see I'm currently on the C drive, users, da, 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 and I'm inside here. This is equivalent to me now doing this. So that's where I am uh, on my uh, machine. Bear with me while we do this. This is utterly essential. I find it fascinating. You mightn't yet, but I promise it's absolutely crucial and gets quite interesting. Um, but you do need to interact with your command prompt uh, to do a lot of this. The more interesting task, uh, now we want to put a copy of Python in this folder. So we've created something called charity-data-download, um, and into that we want to put a copy of Python. And that's what we're referring to as our computational environment. It's the version of Python we're using for a particular analytical um, task. That's hasn't copy and pasted correctly. Uh, yeah, perfect. So this line of code here, uh, it calls on the Python uh, version that's downloaded to my machine in general, um, and it creates a virtual environment called env. Uh, env. Uh, that's just common standard uh, shorthand for creating virtual environments. You, you could have called it whatever you wanted. Um, basically, it's the folder that um, stores the copy of Python. Uh, that you uh, need. So it'll take somewhere between 10, 20 seconds um, to execute probably. Yep, there we go. 
we can check the results. Yeah, as you can see now, a folder called env has been created uh, and inside of it are various files. And as you can see here, um, we've got copies uh, of Python. So there it is. So it's made a copy uh, and it's put it in this charity data download um, folder. So what that means now is basically for any of this work that I do in this folder, I'm using this version of Python. So the main version that I downloaded that's stored in the Anaconda folder, that's uh, preserved. Basically that's untouched, untainted. That will stay as it is until I use it uh, explicitly. So what do we need to do now? So we've created it and um, now we need to activate it. This just tells your machine from now on, use this version uh, of Python until I tell you um, not to. So here I can, you can see why um, it becomes important to know which operating system you have, uh, because on Windows, this is the command for activating your computational environment. Um, on Linux or a Mac, um, it's a slightly different uh, command. So when I do this, you'll notice um, in brackets, you can see the ENV. That now means my machine is using the version of Python that's stored uh, in the env um, folder. To see how this works, you know, you can launch Python uh, through your command prompt. So by typing Python and then minus V, now I'm using, you know, my version of Python stored in the env folder. Um, very uncreatively, oh God, I can't even spell world. There we go, you know, now I'm using Python. As you can see, this isn't a really good way of using Python. You can only type it, you know, one line at a time. Um, much, much easier to do it a different way as we're just about to. But now, as you can see, we've got a local copy of uh, Python. It's activated. So all of our future work um, in this session uses that version um, of Python. Good, so it's set up. We're ready to actually get to an interesting bit of computational work. Um, we're going to download the uh, register of charities. That's basically a census of all registered charities uh, in the Republic of Ireland. Um, it's an Excel file uh, and it's located um, here. So I've written a little bit of Python that, you know, to save me going to this web page and clicking on it here, you know, if you hover over it, you can actually see um, the web address where the file is located. I'm going to use Python to request that file and I'm going to save it uh, to my um, machine. So here's the code we need to do it. So this code uh, is not executable in the notebook. Um, it's stored somewhere else, which I'm just about to uh, show you. But basically this really simple script here downloads that file, saves it um, to our machine. So at this stage again, we're going to move out of Jupyter Notebook back to the command prompt. Um, so the first thing to do is if you are following along online, um, here's the Python script. Uh, so this is the collection of code I just showed you, uh, saved as its own separate file. I'm going to move that into the charity data download folder, uh, and then I'm going to um, execute it. So it is currently stored in the code demos folder. Uh, I'm just going to do this manually for now. Uh, here you go. So if I just do um, control C, uh, and I'll put it into, uh, yeah, put it into the folder that I created, uh, charity data, data download, perfect. Uh, yeah, excellent. So now I have the programming script I need. Um, let's see if it works uh, using my computational uh, environment. So again, it's the same command if you're on Windows, Linux, or Mac. Uh, we use the Python command that just tells your computer, hey, I want to do something in Python and I want to execute all of the code stored in this file uh, right um, here. So intentional error, you'll be glad to know. Python is quite good in terms of errors. It's actually quite descriptive. So as you can see here, there's a module uh, not found error. So there's no module named um, requests. So I wanted to do some web scraping, um, but Python is telling me you haven't installed the requests module. So as you can see, if this was a much more you know, complicated, detailed piece of work across a project team of five people in three different universities or four different departments you know, in a business, 
this is quite annoying. You share your code and then somebody comes back and says, oh, it's giving me this error. You didn't tell me I needed requests, da, da, da. So this is why we create and capture and share computational um, environments. So we get the um, we get the error that we expect. Um, it's telling us that we don't have something called the requests module. So remember I mentioned um, package management systems earlier. So PIP, P-I-P, uh, is a Python uh, whoop, package uh, manager. Not sure why it's not like in the copy and paste. Perfect. There we go. So if I use the pip install requests command, what that does is it downloads the request module. So a module is basically a collection of Python code that allows you to do something. Um, you can see my machine has you know started and successfully uh, downloaded uh, the request module. To prove now that it works, I'm going to re-execute um, the command. This time it should have the request module uh, and it should uh, work. Okay, so I get a little message here. Uh, finished executing script. How do I know it worked? Uh, bingo. There should be a new file that wasn't there before um, containing the uh, register of charities um, that I'm interested um, in. And let's just always, always prove uh, what we're doing just so it's not um, a magic trick that I've spent hours constructing. Yeah, voila, here's a list um, of registered charities in the Republic um, of Ireland. Okay, good, so we've configured, um, or we've managed, you know, the computational environment. Uh, you know, that's all well and good. Um, it's an important uh, task. Uh, what if we want to update? So, you know, things don't stay static. The requests module, you know, improves um, over time. Uh, so let's say we wanted to um, update it. And copy and paste. It's amazing, isn't it? All this technical stuff I'm doing and I can't copy and paste correctly. Perfect. So we can use pip install again, requests, and this time I specify an option, dash dash upgrade, which just tells my computer, you know, uninstall the previous version I downloaded and, you know, install the latest um, version. You can see, because I obviously installed requests about three minutes ago, that it is clearly the most up-to-date version. So that is absolutely um, fine. If I wanted a list uh, of packages that possibly need um, updating, um, I can use the uh, pip uh, list command with the dash dash outdated option specified. That takes a look inside my computational environment and says, okay, uh, it might be worth updating these modules um, here. So the actual installation uh, module called pip um, itself is actually uh, out of date. And really, really helpfully, you know, Python actually gives me um, the command I need to execute if I want to update um, pip. So I'll do that just now, just to show you that this is all very quick and easy uh, and very possible. So this then uh, updates the um, pip module. Great. So we've set one up, we've managed it, and we've uh, we've been able to execute, you know, um, a really simple but still hopefully very useful um, piece of programming. So how do we capture all of this? So we've done the hard work, um, successfully executed the script. Uh, how could I then share this with you? You're all using different machines, Macs, Windows, Linux machines. Uh, you know, you may have different versions of Python. You mightn't have installed it yet, but 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 etc. And um, you're all doing something different on different. Um, machines. So how do I actually capture um, the Python computational environment that I created? So remember I created something in an env, an env folder on my machine. Basically I want to pull out aspects of that folder and I want to share that with you so you can reproduce um, my work. So this command here, but first we'll do uh, the first aspect um, of it. So pip freeze, which is uh, you know quite a funny um, term. Basically, that uh, literally freezes, or you know, it takes a snapshot of your computational environment at this time. So you can see on my machine here, I've got five additional modules that I need to do my web scraping. Um, one, two, three, four, five, perfect. And you can see I've been using the version of requests, which is 2.23.0. So that's really good. Um, if I wanted to share that with you, 
basically I can run the same command again uh, oh my god copy and paste jeez oh uh, basically I'm running the pip freeze command again and then I'm putting the output of that into a file called requirements uh, .txt. Again, to prove that worked, now you can see there's a little notepad file, a little txt file here. And if I click into it, voila, here's the list of modules that I need to do my web scraping. What that means now is I can share that txt file with you. I can share the programming script with you. And as long as you have uh, Python installed on your machine, you should be able to exactly reproduce what I've just done in the last 10 minutes. And that's the real power of this. There shouldn't be any mistakes, no deviations. You should be able to execute the same programming script in the same way to produce ideally the same results, You know, assuming the, the file doesn't go out of date or the web page disappears. Um, and that's, that's just what's so, so powerful um, about this. It's obviously a bit technical to get set up. Um, but now, not to be too grand about it, but people across the world and on different machines and different teams can now all reproduce this work. Um, exactly. Uh, and calling it requirements is just uh, convention or standard. You could have called that file what you want. Um, and we'll show you an example of that um, in just a moment. So basically, my computational environment is a copy of Python that's stored in here, a script that I want to execute, and all of the things the script needs in order to execute. So three simple things, a programming language, a configuration of that programming language, and the actual code um, itself, which is fantastic. Sorry, I do find all this stuff very interesting. Um, maybe that's a bit uh, weird. So in terms of sharing this, I mean, you could just email. So if I emailed you, uh, I really like your work. Could you share you know, your script with me? All you'd have to send me is the requirements.txt file um, and the Python file that I need uh, to execute. So you could just zip these, zip, zip these together and email them. Better practice, as you hopefully agree that we've been doing you know, uh, for the code demonstrations, is just making them publicly um, available. So if you go to our GitHub repository, um, you'll notice that there's always been a, a requirements.txt file um, on the main page. And what this uh, contains is all the Python modules um, you need uh, to reproduce the work. So we've now done four Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, in order to run those on your machine, this is the requirements file um, that you need. Uh, and that's what's been happening. So if you've been launching uh, the notebooks online through MyBinder, as some of you have, basically the server looks at the requirements.txt file and makes the computational environment online for you to be able to uh, use. Uh, so it's all, you know, it's just the, the power of doing this is just fantastic. It's, you know, things have improved um, uh, enormously. Brilliant. So we've created, we've managed, we've updated, uh, and we've captured and shared um, work. So the final thing to do is, let's say somebody else did a piece of work. Uh, unfortunately, this is me again, uh, so I'm going to reproduce some of my own work. Um, but this you know, is a totally new computational environment I want to set up and I want to recreate uh, to do something. So a couple of weeks ago in the first coding demo, um, you know, we did some data manipulation of uh, census files. So we had 1961 census data, you know, we linked it to 71 and 81, we sampled from it, we did various things. So we'll use that example again, a much, much uh, simpler um, example. We're basically just gonna load data in, we're gonna take a quick look at it, uh, and we're just gonna print a message saying, you know, we're finished looking um, at this file. Uh, but this census data task requires different modules um, than the previous one we've just been working on. So we need to set up a new computational um, environment. So we're going through many of the same steps. So I'll, I'll do this quite um, quickly. The first thing I'll do is because I'm done with this computational environment, very simple. If you're done with an environment, deactivate. And as you can see, the um, ENV in brackets, that's now gone. Uh, I'm no longer using that computational uh, environment. So we want to go through uh, the same steps um, again. So I just want to, yeah. So I just want to go back one folder, uh, back to my T95 uh, folder. So 
I swear to God, if I don't copy and paste, just, yeah, don't leave me feedback about this, please. Um, I know what I'm doing. Great. So I want to create a new folder, um, this time calling it census uh, data, uh, what do I call it? Yep, there we go. Census data cleaning. So here's a new blank folder to store my computational uh, environment. Uh, again, I just want to navigate to this folder. As I said, that's just like going in and clicking on it. Uh, again, yeah, that's like what I've done here, just clicked into uh, the folder. So again, exact same task. Uh, I can copy and paste all of this in one go. Um, again, all I'm doing is setting up a computational environment in this folder um, and activating it once again. So again, takes about 10 to 20 seconds. We're making a copy of Python this copy is going to be different than the main installation, and it's going to be different than the one we just created previously for scraping um, charity data. So now we're going to have three copies of Python um, on our machine, and voila. So now we're, um, oh, oh, yeah, no, I picked a different folder. That's the problem. So I was in the wrong folder, apologies. Uh, how did that go wrong? Ah, yeah. I forgot to update it. There you go. Good spot. Uh, it was called something else. So as you can see, I created a folder called this, and then I tried to navigate to a folder called that, which doesn't exist. So apologies. Uh, that'll be really quick. So yep, we navigate to that folder. Um, and we'll just go through the steps again of creating it. Yeah, there we go. Live TV, huh? Perfect. So now we're just creating a computational environment in the folder called census data uh, cleaning, and we're going to activate it, and then we're going to execute our programming script uh, once more. Uh, while we're waiting for that, um, we will move across the files uh, that we need. So in my code folder, uh, there's something called census-1961-data. I'm going to move that in here. So that's the programming script uh, that I need. Uh, and I'm also going to move across the requirements file uh, that I need uh, for this work um, as well. Yeah, perfect. Uh, let's activate yeah, that computational environment. So we're up and running. Uh, let's try and execute the census uh, code. So if you're working uh, through this yourself, um, you can download the files from the notebook. So census data script, there's the data you need, and there's the uh, requirements file. So let's try and execute the uh, Python file. Okay, so we get an expected error again. We need a module called pandas. We haven't installed uh, pandas yet on our machine. Uh, how can we do it? So the whole point of creating a requirements.txt file is that you can actually tell your machine open up the requirements.txt file and work through each of the modules listed. So install all of them in one go. So you don't have to manually say in pip install pandas, pip install requests. Um, in one line of code, we can install um, everything we need to set up uh, this computational uh, environment. So this uh, line of code here, uh, pip install, um, this time we're installing um, what's contained in the txt file. Uh, there's only one thing contained in the txt file, it's just the pandas module. Um, and as you can see, my machine is now installing uh, the module um, that I need. The reason I only need the pandas module in the requirements file, because as you're probably the eagle-eyed uh, among you are probably spotting the fact that lots of things are going on. So uh, there's an other uh, module called numpy, so numeric Python. Um, which has been installed. There's something called PYTZ. Um, there's a module called SIX, for example. Basically, certain modules need other modules in order to function. So by just saying, you know, pip install pandas, Python is smart enough then to go, right, pandas needs these three or four different modules, so we'll install those at the same um, time. So your, your requirements.txt file, you know, doesn't have to be anything, you know, doesn't have to be an essay. It's just, I know that if I tell my machine install pandas, it'll install everything else um, it needs uh, in order to work. So because it's installing lots of other things, you can see, uh, yeah, one, two, three, four, five. So it's installing five modules. It takes a little bit of time. 
because um, it's obviously installing them from an online um, repository. Um, but in, uh, let's say, five, four, three, two, one. Oh, no. I won't try that again. So hopefully in a couple of seconds, uh, it'll have installed uh, all the modules uh, we need. Um, in the meantime, I will keep uh, riffing, I think they call it, as a musician. So the next step, uh, once it's installed everything, is to try and execute the um, programming script uh, again. And this time it should uh, work because we should have installed uh, the pandas uh, module. So it's taking its uh, sweet, sweet uh, time, um, but that's okay. Um, I'm sure Julia can probably put some jokes in the chat. Julia, can you act as the raconteur? Uh, will that work? Yeah, so I'm just now having a little look at the chat myself. So I'll go through... Um, yeah, I'll go through some of your comments about, you know, uh, if you've got Python installed twice, you know, which one uh, do you need? Uh, how do you tell your machine which one to use? Um, you know, etc. cetera, uh, et cetera. Uh, this. Yes, yes, my wall clock is slow. Thanks very much. It's uh, 41. That's quite slow, actually. It's getting slower. That's quite unfortunate. Um, so this is taking quite a while, so I might interrupt it. Oh, no, maybe it's, um, hey, perfect. Okay, it's, ooh, that took, that took a surprising long time. Uh, how bad? Uh, it's up and running now, so, yeah, Julia, that's enough <laughs> joking. Thanks very much. So we're at the final, uh, we're at the end, so now we want to see if the programming command um, actually works. Uh, let's stake my reputation on it. Um, yeah. Whoop. Ah, yeah. So the thing I forgot to do is I forgot to move across the data set. So my script is looking for a data set. I didn't put it in my project folder. Voila. And pressing the up key, that brings up the most recent command. Uh, and now let's see how we, um, yeah, perfect. So it's a very simple programming script. It loads in some census data and it just prints out the first 10 observations um, as well. So don't worry what you know the, the variables mean, you know, um, we're not too interested. It's just a very simple programming uh, script. So now we've gone through a full spectrum of you know technical tasks. Uh, we've created uh, brand new computational environments. We've customized them, you know, we've installed new packages, we've upgraded existing ones, um, we've shared them, so we've seen how you can capture it, so how you can, you know, bundle up the modules you need, put them in a file, and then share that file, you know, with others. Uh, and then we've seen how we can use that file to reproduce um, a computational uh, environment. So voila, yeah, that actually reasonably went uh, well on my end. Um, We've learned lots of things. That was last week's, what have we learned? <laughs> I've just obviously verbally um, outlined what we've learned uh, this week. I find this interesting. I'm sure some of you do as well. Um, and I've seen some of the comments. You're, some of you are familiar with using the command line or the command prompt. Um, so it is quite tricky. Uh, it's quite technical. Um, it is a vital skill for doing computationally intensive um, work, uh, research and analysis. So you need to know, you know, file systems. You need to know how to navigate to a folder. You know, activate an environment, yeah, etc. You need to be able to use the command line interface, which is, you know, quite unforgiving if you make a mistake. You know, as you saw, if I didn't copy and paste the correct thing, um, it can take a while to run all these these things. But I do consider the rewards uh, great. Um, hopefully, you agree. I picked some deliberately very simple programming tasks, um, but you can imagine, you know some natural language processing, you know, you could have hundreds of lines of code, but the process is the same, you know, uh, you need to set up your computational environment, install the packages as you need, execute the commands, and then package all of that up, bundle it up and share it with someone else so that they can use it um, also. So good luck if you're gonna continue doing this. Uh, essential free um, 
further learning uh, the Turing way you've probably seen that before um, I'll just show you superb book um, by a group uh, across different universities but I think based at Cambridge uh, the Turing Institute and um, they've written a, an online book which is absolutely just chock full of fantastic advice and um, you know it goes through open research version control um, and it has an excellent chapter on a uh, reproducible environment so this is how I learned basically to do everything I've just um, shown you but it goes into much much more uh, depth uh, also uh, there's a book called Python 101 uh, which is quite interesting it has a very very short segment you know on um, virtual environments but it's still uh, it's still worth a read um, and there's this good article I found on Medium. Oh no, this is the official documentation uh, for a module called PIP Env. Um, it's based on a lot of the same things you know we've seen today. You know which version of Python do we have? How do we install modules? Um, but it goes into a bit more um, yeah detail. So fantastic. Yep, that's it for me. Uh, I will now take your uh, questions so thank you very much a uh, beautiful day you've spent it inside with me thank you so much i do really really appreciate it uh, okay so let's look at some questions uh, perfect uh julia's jokes uh okay i'll start with most recent let me expand the chat box uh, yeah okay so somebody has asked um, can you use anaconda um, to create uh, computational environments uh, yes you can uh, when you install Python uh, basically you get um, a, a set of modules that are considered standard so there are things that you are almost you know certainly going to need um, in your work so it's called the Python standard library. Uh, you can see I was looking at it recently. Um, and it has a list here of all the different modules that just come installed on your um, machine. You can also install a version of Python from something called uh, Anaconda. So this is basically a customized version of Python. So Anaconda have gone to the, the kind of hard work of thinking about all the modules you will need to install on your machine um, and it you know provides them for you if you download their version uh, of Python uh, so absolutely um, you can use a version uh, of Python uh, provided by Anaconda so requests for example that comes with Anaconda you don't need to install that on your machine uh, it's already provided um, but obviously lots of other packages are not so you still have to go through the process um, I showed you today um, but maybe not as often. Um, so yes, you can also use Anaconda um, for installing and upgrading uh, packages. Um, and j uh, just Google it. There'll be, you know, there'll be lots of information about how you uh, use Conda. Uh, yeah. So there you go. Create virtual environments with Python uh, for Python with Conda. Um, it's much the same process, but instead of you know using uh, Python minus M. V V A V E N V, um, yeah, you can see here it's a different piece uh, of uh, code. So, sorry, long answer short. Yes, you can use the what's called the Anaconda distribution of Python uh, to install and update modules uh, on your machine. Uh, so I'll work backwards from now. Uh, is there an equivalent of requirements if using R in R Studio? Uh, yes, there is. Um, Usually the way I've done it in R before is you would just give R like a list. So you've got the install.packages command and into that you would have a list of the packages um, you want to install. Um, yeah, presumably you could just place the list of all those packages in a TXT file and then in R open the TXT file and you know load it into a list and then uh, put that list into the install.packages um, command yes uh, but R is not something I use a lot myself but I'm almost certain you can do something very very um, similar uh, I don't know what the cheese says when it sees itself in the mirror no I don't <laughs> uh, okay uh, a more serious uh, question uh, ooh, when printing in Jupyter notebook can you print without the 
uh, input lines. Would you mind just saying a little bit more about that? I'll, I'll answer that question, but I'm just not entirely sure what you mean by printing uh, in that sense. Uh, if you could just write a little bit more. Um, a oh, question here, uh, so to reduce waste, can you automatically purge unnecessary resources uh, in the environment? Again, I'm not entirely sure what you uh, mean by that. Do you mean like unnecessary modules? Uh, is that like uninstalling unnecessary modules? Uh, if so, then yes, you can obviously uh, uninstall modules as well using pip. Um, modules don't tend to take up a lot of uh, space on your machine. I mean, you know, Python code, like any code, is just text um, that's interpreted in a certain way. So modules don't tend to uh, take up a lot of space. So in that sense, I wouldn't advocate, you know, downloading the Anaconda version of Python and then uninstalling modules that you think you might never um, need. So if that's what you mean by that question, then yes, you can uh, automatically or manually purge unnecessary modules, but I don't really um, advocate it. Oh yeah, and just about the R question, um, yeah, uh, Rob has put something in about um, R Studio, so thank you very much. That's a really good um, solution. And Yeah, so we had uh, a question here about Yes. So yeah, again, sorry, there, there are sometimes there are problems getting by, uh, my binder up and running. Um, because it's free, uh, it can sometimes, um, yeah, just take its time to uh, load or, you know, the server crashes. So apologies for that if it's not. Um, uh, but as I said, uh, Julius posted a link to the uh, GitHub. Um, yeah, so as long as you know where the open data or, or uh, the code demo GitHub repository is then, you know, all of the notebooks are there. You can install them on your machine. Uh, and then, as I said, you can take the uh, requirements.txt file and do pip install uh, minus r requirements.txt. And then you'll have everything you need to run the code, uh, the code books on your um, personal uh, machine. Uh, okay, so I'll, yeah, I'm happy to keep tipping away. Um, I'm obviously finished in terms of content, but um, I'm going to keep answering questions. Um, yeah, okay, let me keep scrolling. Oh, I see, right. Uh, so in Jupyter Notebook, um, you can print a hard copy of your notebook from the file uh, menu. Uh, uh, yes, so very good point. Uh, shouldn't the requirements include the Python version uh, for reliable portability? Uh, yes, absolutely. So into the requirements file, um, I could and probably should have put the version of Python um, that I was act that I actually used um, in the uh, programming that I did today. So yep, um, absolutely. Uh, you've held me to account there. Um, best practice would be putting the version of Python um, yep, into the requirements uh, .txt file. So uh, yeah, well spotted, thank you. Um, so yeah, I haven't been perfectly reproducible <laughs> or transparent. Um, oh yeah, that came up earlier. Thanks, Julia. And, all right. uh, would you recommend using Visual Studio? I haven't used that since first year of uni, uh, so it depends on the task you have in mind. Um, my limited recollection is that you know Visual Studio is good for software development. Um, I've never used it for data science or computational social science work. Uh, I'd assume it has functionality that allows you to do web scraping and you know data analysis and machine learning, for example. Um, Oh, I see. Sorry, I, it didn't scroll down far enough. So would you recommend using Visual Studio for Python programming? I can't answer that question directly. Um, what I can say is I use various platforms for writing Python code. Uh, so one obvious one, as you've seen, is um, Jupyter Notebooks. They have certain advantages. They have certain disadvantages. Uh, I quite like using something called Sublime Text, which you can uh, see here. Um, so this is for my own research. I tend to write Python modules 
um, that people can then use themselves to collect um, data about charities. So here's some Python code I've written, uh, you know, 104 lines. Um, and as you can see, it doesn't have a lot of comments because it's quite hard to write comments. I mean, it's got some, um, but you know, the output doesn't look great um, when you do it. So uh, let's just see if this actually works. Um, so you, you can execute the Python code in Sublime Text. You don't need to um, yeah, use um, Jupyter Notebooks or something else. So you can see the script is running. Uh, yeah, the output is pretty rudimentary. It's not as nice as a Jupyter Notebook, uh, but it works. So whatever it was doing, um, it works. You can write your Python code in, you know, Notepad. It's as simple as that. You know, you would just, you know, you could have import you know, requests. And as long as you save that file as something dot py file extension, uh, then it would be a Python uh, executable uh, script. Perfect. Uh, wow, Julia, that is not terribly funny, but I see somebody did find that funny. Um, okay. <laughs> Again, uh, I'm happy to stay on for uh, another few minutes if you have more questions. Uh, if not, what's going to happen next is we will um, email everyone who signed up to all of the coding demos. We'll uh, provide a link to the GitHub repository um, and an evaluation. This was a pilot. Um, it was very enjoyable uh, for me um, to deliver and for Julia to help me with. I know that. I know some of you have found it good. Uh, there's elements of it that could certainly be done better. So if you do get a chance, it'll be a really quick evaluation, you know, five or six questions. Um, and the main thing as well is just let us know about extra topics. So Julie is going to do some text mining quite soon. Um, I've got plans for social media, social network. <clears throat> do you want to learn how to use the command line? Do you want to learn uh, machine learning, big data? You know, crikey, it's it's endless really, isn't it? Um, so yeah, so just yeah, or even just contact Julia and myself, you know, on Twitter using our emails, and we'll we'll be glad to, uh, you know, help you, uh, chat to you. Um, okay, so final couple of questions: Is social science part of data science? Uh, yes, I think um, the term that's gaining traction is computational social science, which means um, answering social science questions using data science approaches. So I think data science is a is a separate thing to social science, um, but it influences it. And uh, the main way it influences it is through a new disciplinary field called computational social science. So traditional social science questions about, you know, social networks and distancing and, you know, uh, social capital are now, you know, being studied using Twitter data and Facebook data, you know, etc. But I agree, the terms can be quite unhelpful. What you know, big data analytics, data science, computational social science, um, st well, statistical learning is another one. Yeah, it's it's it's. Uh, uh, can Python produce compiled code uh, for speed? Uh, Python is not the fastest language for that. So Python does use a lot of C code um, to underpin uh, a lot of its modules. Um, uh, Python is slower because uh, it uses an interpreter uh, instead of a compiler, so it's not it's not very fast. But what I'm talking about here is if you know you were a software developer, you know Python wouldn't be as fast as C, and it wouldn't be as I think flexible as Java, for example. Um, but it's obviously simpler. Uh, it's very very extensible. You know, it's it's yeah. Um, hopefully that's a good enough language or answer. Apologies, it might it might not be. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, a command line session would be great. I'll keep that in mind. We can. Uh, I'm going to take a break in June, <laughs> so maybe in July, that would be good. Uh, yeah, machine learning using Python, deep learning. Can you create another Bitcoin using Python? Uh, I think that's the whole appeal of Bitcoin, isn't it? That the algorithm and the code used to create it is is so secret and so clever. Uh, it's not something I plan on doing anytime soon, but um, I'm sure you could do your own. You could create your own cryptocurrency, but don't quote me on that. Uh, thanks very much. Okay, it's one minute to five. Um, 
I'm going to stop the stream. This will be put up online so you can rewatch or you know uh, watch it for the first time if this is how you come across it. A sincere thank you. Uh, really appreciate you giving up your time. It's an exciting area. Um, good luck with what you're doing. Please contact us and Julia and I will speak to you uh, soon. Goodbye.